Welcome everyone. I am Sharisa Martin, the Program Manager for Professional Development at the American Society for Cell Biology. We are pleased to offer our Online with LSC as a part of ASCB's Professional Development Webinar Series. Today, our facilitator, Dr. Deidre Writing, will be introducing our featured author for this installment of Online with LSE. Deidre, you can turn your camera on now. Thank you, Sharisa. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Online with LSE webinar series. My name is Deidre Writing. I am the Executive Director of the Advanced Office of Faculty Development at Northeastern University. It is my pleasure to introduce today's featured study, a framework of college student buy-in to evidence-based teaching practices in STEM, the roles of trust and growth mindset. The goal of this webinar is to provide behind the scenes insights into biology education studies. As questions come to you during the talk, I invite you to share them using the Q&A feature. This will ensure that you have a rich discussion following the talk. I am pleased to introduce our featured author, Dr. Kong Wong. Dr. Wong is a research fellow in social psychology at the University of Michigan. Her research utilizes the framework of self-determination theory to investigate the contextual and individual factors promoting student motivation. She also examines the impacts of students on students of having school leaders trained in culturally inclusive teaching practices. Previously, Dr. Wong was a postdoctoral associate at Yale, and she holds a PhD in educational psychology from Purdue. Welcome, Kong. We are very excited to hear your talk today. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Deirdre, for the kind introduction. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me to share my work published in CBE LIC. And I'm really excited to be here uh, with all of you. Well, today I'm presenting this work on behalf of my co-authors. You can see them on the screen. This study is one of the projects that I did as a postdoc researcher in the STEM program, program evaluation and the research lab at Yale University. Dr. Mark Graham is the director of the lab as well as the PI of this project. And this study is part of a large conversation um, about how to promote students' engagement and learning in STEM fields via evidence-based teaching practices. And more information can be found on the STEM Pro website. Dr. Andrew Kavner is a former postdoc of the lab, and Julia Gill and Melanie Bauer are our current and uh, former uh, project managers and Dr. Philip Reeves, Dr. David Hanauer, and Dr. Xin Yan Chen, they are our long-term collaborators. This work won't be possible without the team. And today I'm going to talk a bit about one of the papers published in CBE LIC. And before I take any questions, I will first give you an overview of this study. Okay, over the past few decades, Educational researchers and the practitioners have put lots of efforts into transforming undergraduate STEM courses from passive lecture-based to more active evidence-based. And the research on evidence-based teaching practices shows benefits uh, of evidence-based teaching for college STEM students. And particularly for members from traditionally underrepresented groups in sciences. However, like recent observational studies has indicated that um, the majority of STEM instructors still rely heavily on lecture. And some STEM instructors and students show resistance to teaching and learning in ways prescribed by uh, evidence-based teaching. There were many possible factors that can help explain the barriers to uh, using evidence-based teaching practices in STEM courses. And our research team focused on a specific social cognitive factor, 
called buy-in. Buy-in refers to individuals' general feelings in relation to a new way of thinking or behaving. And uh, instructors buy into evidence-based teaching practices refers to a sense of commitment to incorporate, uh, adopt evidence-based teaching practices in their own teaching, as well as a belief that the changes in their teaching practices will have positive impacts on their students. And we believe that in order to promote and the implementation of evidence-based teaching practices, just training instructors about the practices is not sufficient. Because if instructors do not truly believe that the suggested practices will have positive impact on their student learning, they are unlikely to engage in implementing those practices in their classrooms. And our lab's previous work conducted by Dr. Aragon has shown that instructors uh, who have a high level of buy-in toward evidence-based teaching practices are more likely to implement those practices in their classrooms. However, our research did not stop at the instructor level because although instructors' implementation of evidence-based teaching practices is important, it's not the ultimate goal of faculty professional development. The ultimate goal is to promote student engagement and promote student success in STEM fields. So we applied the construct, the idea of buy-in as well as the buy-in framework to understand students' experiences. And this is also the focus of the current study that I'm going to talk about today. Like instructors buy into evidence-based teaching practices affect their adoption of such practices. We believe that students buy into evidence-based teaching practices also affect how much they can learn from the class uh, featuring evidence-based teaching. And our lab's prior work conducted by Dr. Kavanaugh who is also one of the co-authors on this paper has supported this argument and demonstrate the positive associations between student buy-in, student engagement, and student outcomes. In this study, student buy-in is operationalized through a, a process framework called EPIC framework. The EPIC framework was originally developed by Dr. Aragon and Dr. Bram for understanding instructors' adoption of evidence-based teaching practices. And here in this study, we applied this work to understand and explain students' learning experiences. So here I will walk you through this process. Um, First, after students being exposed uh, to evidence-based teaching practices in uh, transformed uh, STEM courses, uh, students need to be first be persuaded that the evidence-based teaching practices used by their instructors are of educational value. And then they need to identify with those practices and believe that those practices are good for them personally and are compatible with their uh, learning approaches. And after that, they need to commit to this way of learning in the future. Students who um, demonstrated high levels of buy-in to evidence-based teaching practices are more likely to engage in learning activities in the classrooms. And in this study, students buy-in toward evidence-based evidence teaching practices was assessed by three indicators, persuasion, identification, and commitment. Well, in addition to testing the effects of student buy-in itself, factors that influence buy-in are also important. In this study, we examined the two uh, social cognitive factors that affect the students' buy-in. 
Uh, one is trust, the other is growth mindset. Um, trust uh, refers to a perception that the instructor understands the challenges facing students as they progress through the course and accept the students for who they are and uh, cares about uh, the educational welfare of students. And active learning environments are designed to maximize the interaction between student and uh, their instructor. A growing literature on instructor-student interactions suggests that building personal connections with students improves a range of student outcomes, including motivation, attitudes toward learning, and uh, engagement and performance. If students trust their instructors, in other words, they believe that their instructors understand and accept and uh, care about their learning needs, they are likely to agree that the course activities that the instructor has chosen for them will benefit them and show more buy-in to evidence-based teaching practices. And the student's growth mindset is another social cognitive factor that we examined. We chose this factor because it's a consistent predictor of educational success. It captures fundamental beliefs about one's ability to gain knowledge through experiences. And students who maintain growth mindsets tend to view intelligence as malleable and something can be changed, can be improved. Well, those with a fixed mindset believe intelligence is relatively unchanged by experience. Students with growth mindset uh, tend to uh, see classroom uh, experiences as learning opportunities that will help them grow, uh, that will benefit their development. And therefore, they are likely to embrace the evidence-based teaching practices. Drawing upon our prior research findings, as well as the literature in psychology and in education, we proposed a, a buy-in framework to understand the college students' learning experiences in transformed STEM courses featuring evidence-based teaching practices. Specific, specifically, we hypothesized that students' trust in instructors and the growth mindset will enhance their buy-in toward evidence-based teaching practices through the pathway from persuasion to identification to commitment. In turn, the buy-in will foster students' engagement and uh, subsequently affect the desired student outcomes. So here I'm going to talk about a bit, a bit about the research background of this study. Uh, we tested our buy-in framework with participants of the National Institutes on Scientific Teaching, formerly known as the Summer Institutes on Scientific Teaching. The Summer Institute is a national professional development program in which uh, college level instructors participate in an intensive week long training in evidence based teaching practices focused on active learning and uh, a metacognition, formative assessment, as well as uh, inclusive teaching. And our sampling procedure in consists of two phases. First, we identified a sample of instructors who had attended at least one summer institute on scientific teaching and who reported implemented a high number of evidence-based teaching practices. And 14 high implementing instructors from 14 institutions were included in this study, including 11 female instructors and the three male instructors. Most of the instructors were teaching in uh, research intensive universities. After we identified the high implementing instructors, we contact the students who enrolled in their courses and inviting them to participate in uh, our online survey. 
The final sample includes 2,102 students. The large scale student data does not only allows, allow us to test a relatively complicated model as we proposed, but also give us the opportunity to test the invariance of the model across different groups of students. And in this study, we examined the generalizability of this buy-in framework across various racial and ethnic groups and between female students and the male students. This is an overview of the measures. Student trust in their instructors, growth mindset, buy into evidence-based teaching practices, engagement in self-regulated learning behaviors, and the science persistence were assessed using the existing reliable and valid skills. To account for the measurement errors, we treated these constructs as latent variable in our structure equation modeling. And the latent variable refers to that the variables that cannot be measured or cannot be observed directly, but rather inferred through a mathematical model from multiple observed indicators. And in this, in and later I will show you that in this model, we use OWLs to represent the latent variables. And student final course grade was used as the uh, performance outcome. The grade was provided by instructors and then normalized to a full scale uh, score. Students' course grade was included in the model as an observed variable and included and represented by a rectangle. So here, this is the hypothesized model. You can see that all variables except for grade was represented by ovals because they cannot be measured directly. So the main question we want to, I want to remind you uh, of our main research question. We want to know whether this proposed uh, buy-in framework can be used to understand the students' learning experiences in uh, science courses featuring evidence-based teaching practices. And uh, the result of the structure equation modeling shows that it's this model is a good fit for, uh, to the data. And all the standardized path coefficients were significant at uh, 0.001 level and in the expected direction. And uh, let's focus on the left set of this model first. In accordance with our hypothesis, both the student trust and the growth mindset were positively associated with persuasion. That's the first stage of student buy-in. And notably, students' trust in their instructor was more than twice as predictive of buy-in, suggesting that students' views of their instructors are more associated with thriving in a high evidence-based teaching context than their views of intelligence. Okay, the right side of the model uh, is about the effect of buy-in on student outcomes. In line with our previous research, student commitment, the last stage of buy-in, was positively associated with student engagement in self-regulated learning behaviors, which in turn was associated with uh, student persistence in science and the final course grade. This finding demonstrates that students' level of buy-in uh, is key to attaining many, like many of the long desired student outcomes in undergraduate STEM courses. In terms of the relationships among the buy-in constructs, persuasion, identification, and commitment were positively associated with each other, which supported the EPIC framework. However, it is worth noting that the relationship between persuasion and identification was relatively weak, which suggests that uh, persuasion may not always lead to identification. Uh, however, the relationship between identification and commitment was relatively strong, indicating that once student 
identify with the uh, practice. They, they think the practice is good for them personally. They are likely to commit to engage in, in the practice in the future. And after confirming the hypothesized framework, we carried out a series of multi-group structure equation modeling to evaluate the invariance of the model. And we found that the framework of student buy-in holds across diverse groups in terms of gender and the race and the ethnicity. To summarize, the single most important message I would like to leave you with is the framework of student buy-in to evidence-based teaching practices. With a large scale data from multiple instructors and multiple institutions, we demonstrated that this framework is a valid representation of college students' learning experiences within uh, evidence-based teaching contexts. Specifically, students buy-in is a critical factor affecting student engagement and uh, learning outcomes. Building student trust and fostering growth mindset are potential approaches to gaining students buy-in toward evidence-based teaching practices. And last but not least, I want to thank all the course instructors and the students who participate in our study and all of the funding, our collaborators on the grant. And I also want to thank the anonymous reviewers who gave us lots of helpful comments and the suggestions. And thank you. I'm really excited to get questions from the audience. Thank you so much, Kong. I, after reading the paper, I was really excited about your study and uh, the overview really, really helped remind me of, of what a great study this is. I, uh, I'm gonna start us off with a few questions, but I want to, again, invite the audience to put their questions into the Q&A so that I can ask them as we go along. My first question is, uh, one of the significant findings of your study is that trust, had a more substantial impact than the growth mindset on student buy-in. Uh, were you surprised by this result? And why do you think trust has such a strong effect? Well, thanks for bringing this up. This is actually one of our major takeaways from this data. And uh, we are not surprised to see that trust uh, is a much stronger predictor of student buy-in than growth mindset because we have, uh, we have seen a similar result in Dr. Kavanagh's 2018 paper in which he tested the relationships between uh, by student buy-in and engagement and uh, outcomes with a smaller sample from uh, one single biology course. And in fact, uh, if we take a closer look at our a bivariate correlation table in the paper, you, you can see that students' trust in their instructor has stronger associations with all student outcomes, including uh, engagement, uh, science persistence, and uh, course grade than uh, students' individual growth mindset. And uh, I, that's not what uh we that's not what we want to study in this study like why trust is a much stronger um, predictor so i don't have the empirical data to answer this question but i suspect that this has something to do with our research context because in this study all the instructors uh participated in our uh, study are identified as high implementing instructors of evidence-based teaching practices. And they implemented a variety of evidence-based teaching practices in their classroom. And this is not only um, based on their self-report data, although like we first uh, like ask the teachers how many practices you have in implemented in your course. We also sent one of our uh, research team members to observe each classrooms 
and confirmed that yes, their classroom are highly like evidence based um, and have a lot of active learning activities. And because those like active learning activities or uh, other evidence-based teaching practices are supposed to maximize the interaction between student and instructor as well as among students. Um, so we are, so it's, it makes sense to see that relationships play a more important role in the classroom. Like um, here we, the relationship will be like the students trust in their instructors and because their instructors can affect their learning experiences uh, in addition to just a lecture they can uh, affect their learning experiences through formative assessment and through group work and uh, i think that's maybe that's one possible factors uh, affecting the Relationship, relationship between trust uh, and uh, and the student buy-in, and I also think this may explain that why we see a relatively weak relationship between both mindset and uh, and the student buy-in or other uh, student outcomes, because like in the active learning classrooms, students probably have more opportunities to demonstrate their learning, to demonstrate their ability and receive feedback and to see their progress through the course. So then their, in their global beliefs about intelligence plays a, a less important role in this context. And we, we feel this, is, this result is kind of encouraging because faculty members may find they have more capacity to impact a student trust uh, as compared to affect a student, how students view about uh, intelligence. Great, as, as you were talking, there are two other questions um, along those lines on that topic. So I wanna ask those first. I know there are other questions, so I'm gonna be jumping around a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. The first is, hi, thank you for your, the informative talk. Are there any specific examples of how to build trust uh, buy-in uh, in an online environment? Okay, that's a that's a good question. Like, yes, since we find that trust plays a important role in promote buy-in, so the very like the the natural question will be how we can build a trust, and. Uh, and I feel the research in psychology and the education suggested that providing like a safe and uh, uh, autonomy supportive uh, environment can be a uh, effective way to build trust. And uh, that was, we have uh, research to demonstrate the relationship between uh, having a safe, autonomy, supportive environment um, and the student-teacher relationship in classroom in general. And uh, in terms of the online environment, I don't have specific strategies that applied to online environment. Um, but I think the general strate uh, strategies like Give, providing students with choice, acknowledge their perspectives, and uh, ask uh, stu take students' perspectives into your um, classroom, in include your course assignments and uh, course design. Those things should be applied to online environment as well. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, have you looked at the impact of instructors growth mindset on buy in of, by students? That's a good question. Actually, in our previous uh, studies focusing on teachers, focusing on the relationship, be relationship between teachers buy in and the teachers uh, adoption of evidence based teaching practices, we have identified that teachers growth mindset uh, will affect uh, how much they implement those practices uh, in their classrooms. 
Uh, however, we haven't linked the uh, uh, teacher's growth mindset to students' uh, experiences yet, but that's something we want to do in the future. Because as you can see, like in my overview, we have done the work focusing on teachers and we have work done focusing on students. And uh, the next step, we, we want to combine these together so we can have a full picture of the um, how evidence-based teaching can affect uh, the STEM courses? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I agree. It's a new research question for you. <laughs> um, yes. How much variation in trust was there within instructor compared to across instructors? Uh, are some instructors consistently better at fostering trust than others? Or is it very individual depending on the student interaction, the student instructor interaction? Okay, so first thing like is the variation in trust. Um, in our data, we have uh, 14 instructors from 14 institutions and we examined uh, the between uh, instructor variation and uh, within instructor variation uh, in terms of student trust. And we found that um, there is little variation in trust uh, across instructors. That may be because all instructors are high implementing of evidence-based teaching practices. So that's the research context of our work that those are all like teachers engage, like highly engaged in using evidence-based teaching in their classrooms. Maybe that, that, that could be one of the reasons that why we see little variation across instructors. But and, uh, in this study, we, we do have um, observed uh, a certain level of variation within a classroom. So that means even with the, even learning with the same instructor, students' feelings of the trust or the perceptions of trust varied a lot. So that's again indicated it's important to take individual students' um, background and the views into consideration. One question that's slightly related to that, uh, was there any noteworthy differences between groups of faculty and any of the factors that you measured? For example, assistants, um, assistants, professors felt less responsible, responsibility slash agency uh, to make changes. Faculty of color felt more pressure to act. Uh, Do you want me to repeat that? <laughs> yes, could you repeat that again? Yeah. Um, was there any note, or I guess, were there any noteworthy differences between groups of faculty uh, in any of the factors that you measured? For example, assistant professors might have felt less responsibility or agency to make changes or faculty of color felt more pressure. Like, I guess so, um, yeah, yeah, were you grouping faculty and, and looking at uh, them as different groups? Yes, that's a good question. And uh, we, we don't observe significant difference among the instructors and uh, that's because we only have 14 instructors in this, uh, in this data. So we couldn't detect any significant or meaningful differences among them. And, but I, that, that, that's a, a great question that can be answered by like other studies. Um, because I, I, remem I remember reading literature talking about that the, like, I think in a specific, for example, like, let me think about a specific type of evidence-based teaching called like inclusive teaching. That's more related to teacher's background because if we like, when we want to promote uh, 
a diverse or inclusive learning environment, use inclusive teach, incorporate inclusive teaching in their uh, classrooms. I think we observed uh, some resistance from the dominant group members. And, uh, and that had been that we, we have discussed uh, the resistance from the, the, the white teachers in our previous webinar. And uh, I think in that case, you, we tend to see differences among instructors, but that's not what we uh, focused on this study and also the nature of the data couldn't allow us to further investigate the differences among instructors. Awesome. Um, stress is a really uh, hot topic here. Yeah. Uh, and this, this is a really interesting one. What are your thoughts on the role of peer-peer trust on buy-in uh, in engagement in active learning environments? Uh, peer peer trust uh, in that like student among trust among students. Okay, yes. Um, I do think that peer peer trust the, the, the relationship, the relationship among students can play a role in students feelings uh, in the class. And that was not investigated in this study but uh, has been demonstrated to be a uh, important factor uh, affecting students' motivation and uh, learning experiences um, in the field, like in the uh, research done um, in the motivational research. Um, however, there's, pay, there's studies showing that their study specifically compare the, the impact of student teacher relationship and the student student relationship on student learning. And uh, they found that student instructor relationship plays a more important role in their perceived learning and uh, their actual learning than peer peer relationship. And that's why like, we think trust, uh, that's why like in this study, we want to focus on trust and the relationship between with their teachers. But I do think student-student relationship is also important. That's really interesting. Okay, one final question about trust. <laughs> I believe you showed, or I think this is actually true, that uh, the model held your model held across different groups of students. Does this indicate that trust was similar across different groups of students, or did you observe differences in trust for different groups of students? For example, students of color versus white students or males versus females? Yes, that's a good question. And we, we do investigate that. And uh, for first, I will talk about race, like race and uh, ethnicity. Trust, uh, trust uh, was perceived similarly across racial and ethnic groups. So among white students, like, rich, like underrepresented minorities and uh, students from other race and ethnicity, their, um, their like, responses to the trust measure are similarly. And uh, the relationship between trust and the buy-in the, the relationship was similarly across the, those uh, groups of students. However, for female and the male students, we do observe the uh, difference. And we found that female students and the male students interpret the measures of trust differently. It, it's not about the, the magnitude of trust, like they, we, if you look at the, the mean value of female students and male students, you don't see the difference between male and the female students. But based on the measurement invariance analysis, we found that the, these different items, these 
um, the measures to assess trust worked differently between male students and the female students. So that's something we would like to uh, further investigate. And the, the Stamper research team is currently refining, trying to refine the measure of trust. And uh, then like we can, after we can ensure the invariance of the measure between male and the female, and then we can move on to investigate whether the relationship between trust and the buy-in work differently or similarly between male uh, and the female students. That's really interesting. Can you give me an example of like what might be going on? I know you said uh -huh. that further study is needed, but yes. I'm very curious about that. So for example, like one of the uh, items to assess, uh, so trust uh, include the three um, subconstructs like understanding, care, care, and uh, accept. So, if one of the item will be like, I think my teachers care about uh, my learning needs. For example, that that um, the, the item will be similar to that. And the female student and the male student may interpret this item differently. So they one day respond to this item, they may think different things. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So there's one question about the EPIC framework here, mm -hmm. um, about has it been used in summer science programs uh, before, science, uh, before students matriculate? If so, what were the results? Um, can, can you say it again? Could you? Has the EPIC framework been used in any science, uh, summer science programs, like before students go on to college, I guess, or before, before they enter these classes that you're studying? Hmm, the EPIC. I, I, for the Summer Institute, Summer Institute is a professional development program for instructors. I think you're talking more about, mm -hmm. and you alluded to this in the paper, how you said that um, students may have had some exposure to mm -hmm. uh, you know, the things that you're testing before they come to the classroom. So you don't really have a sense of like how much students already buy in bef before they come in. And I guess this, this question is kind of, piggybacking on that a little bit um, in terms of whether or not the EPIC framework has been used in like summer science programs for students. Okay, okay. Thanks for the explanation. Yes. Um, I, I think the buy-in framework or the EPIC framework should be uh, applied to other contexts. So other than like, this this specific research context. So in our measures, we ask students whether they have been exposed to a specific evidence-based teaching practices, but we didn't specify, oh, I'm sorry. We did specify that whether they observed that, uh, that whether they have been exposed to that practices in that specific course. So we, we didn't control for their prior experience with the evidence-based teaching practices. And yes, and but I suspect that if we apply this framework to um, a different context, for example, uh, just a, a regular STEM course, no matter the instructor attended the summer institute institute or not, I think the the framework should hold. Um, but I would like to see more research on this. I agree. And, you know, I, I sort of interpreted that question for myself. So if the person who asked it, if they, you have a follow-up question, please add it into the, uh, the Q&A. Uh, the next question I'd like to ask is, is there any indication that uh, from your research or the work of others, that there are other factors that influence buy-in in addition to trust and growth mindset? If so, uh, what might these factors be? Yes, that's uh, 
that's the other predictors of buy-in. That's something I'm definitely interested in uh, keep investigating. And I'm a motivational researcher and I specifically use the framework of self-determination theory to understand uh, college students' learning experiences. And based on the work I've done, um, including several large scale study uh, focusing on active learning, I feel students' individual motivation may affect how they react or how they view the evidence-based teaching practices. Uh, for example, like if students take a course, take a STEM course, because they're really interested in learning the course content, or uh, if they, they take the course because the course is relevant to their future career, they probably will be willing to engage in the course activities they probably will like to put efforts into the course. However, if they take the course just to fulfill their uh, degree requirement, so take the course because of uh, for the external motivation, they probably won't enjoy doing the activities that suggested by the evidence-based teaching practices. Because we all know that evidence-based teaching practices require students active participation rather than passive learning. So they cannot just uh, sit there and uh, listen to the, their teacher's lecture, but they actually need to work hard and engage in the classroom conversation or engage in the class uh, activities. And they may not, um, they may show less buy-in toward evidence-based teaching practices. So that's one um, factor that I can think of affecting students by in. But the, the environment, the classroom environment may also matter. Like whether the, like trust is one indicator of the classroom, classroom in environment, but there are other uh, variables such as how much students perceive they have autonomy in the classroom, and uh, their sense of competence in the classroom, those contextual factors may also affect how they experience the, in those evidence-based teaching context. And yeah, I'm sure there are other factors that can affect the student buy-in. And I, I'm ho I hope to see more research on this. And that's definitely um, something on my research plan. Yeah, sounds like there's definitely room to add to the model and, and dissect it further. Um, my very first question was about whether you found the trust results surprising. Mm -hmm. uh, and you said no. <laughs> so I'm curious whether, are, were there other of your findings that you did find surprising? Mm, I would say yes and no. And uh, yes, we did find uh, something that very interesting, but not uh, in our original research hypothesis. That's the relationship among the buy-in constructs, like persuasion, identification, and the commitment. I talk about a little bit in the overview, but I would like to elaborate on that. So um, based on the IPIC, IPIC framework, these three variables should be positively correlated with each other that has been supported by our data. But we do find a weak relationship between persuasion and the identification. That's the thing uh, like not in our expectation or in our original hypothesis. But um, it, after have a second thought on that, we feel it kind of makes sense because in this study, persuasion refers to how much students think the practices have educational value. Identification is about how much they like the practices personally. And uh, both the literature and my personal experience tell me that even students can recognize the value of certain practices. They may not enjoy doing it themselves. 
<laughs> like exams, more, many students will agree that having exams and the quizzes can help them learn, but they may not check, oh, I like doing this, I enjoy doing this. Right. And also group work, group work, tens of research suggested that group work can benefit student learning. And if you show the evidence to students, they may agree, okay, group work is good generally, but may not fit my need, may not suit me. So that's why like we, we observe a relatively weak relationship between persuasion and identification. However, once students identify with the practices, think that the practices are good for them personally, they, they tend to commit to this uh, way of learning in the future. So we see a strong relationship between identification and, uh, and the commitment. Very interesting, very interesting. We are drawing close. I know it's surprising. We're drawing close to the end of our time together. So if you would like to get your last question in, please put them in the q and I, uh, I have one more question. And uh, so in the discussion, you highlighted that a longitudinal or pre-post study design may have given uh, more reliable results. Uh, can you share the rationale for um, some of the study design choices that you made and the feasibility of uh, other study designs, would it have been possible to have uh, a control group, for example? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, okay. The research design. In this study, we use a cross-sectional re uh, research design. Uh, we use that to investigate uh, the relationships uh, among variables with data collected at one time point. We chose this design because we want to test the validity of our proposed uh, conceptual framework with large scale data. And uh, a cross-sectional design is very useful for exploring relationships between variables. And once we confirmed the relationship um, as we found in this study, the next step is to further, further test the direction of the relationship. Uh, like for example, in this study, we, based on the theory, we proposed that, that it's trust uh, that affect uh, students buy in. However, the nature of this data, the cross-sectional data, couldn't allow us to rule out the, the, the other way. Like it's also possible that students buy in toward evidence-based teaching practices may contributes to an increase in trust. So this, this cross-sectional design could allow us to say one or say one way or another. So that's why in the discussion, we suggest uh, uh, future studies to use other research designs such as pre-post uh, uh, design or longitudinal design to further investigate the causal relationships among the variables. And, and uh, okay, you, you mentioned the, the control, whether it's possible to have a control group. And yes, yes, it's absolutely possible to have a quasi-experimental design with comparison and the control groups. Um, however, like, well, I have uh, a little bit of concern about that because in order to use that design, the comparison, the control group, e researchers need to identify very effective intervention approaches that can change trust or growth mindset. And uh, this, this type of design also requires lots of effort and time from instructors. So I would suggest doing some uh, randomized control, like some small randomized control experiment first. And after we are very confident in the strategies uh, to improve trust or improve growth mindset, we can move on to the uh, testing and the intervention or testing the causal effect of trust and the growth mindset on buy-in in real classrooms. Well, thank you so much, Kong, for sharing your research with us and for this engaging Q&A session. 
I, I'd also like to thank uh, the organizers uh, for, for providing online with LSE. It's, it's been a really great journey this year. And I, I would also like to thank uh, everyone for attending. And I would like to ask, you know, in, in the way of an assessment for us, uh, please use the chat box to write one interesting thing that you learned during today's session.